you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire, and you are listening to the Maura Murray series. This happens to be our longest running series because this case is just so perplexing. And the mountain and mountain of coincidences and anomalies in this case, I mean, this is a coincidence theorist's dream. They have more things to write off as coincidences than any other true crime case as of yet. Although there are some other cases that are quite perplexing as well, which we cover on Mindshot. In this episode, enter Frank Kelly and the New Hampshire League of Investigators. We will once again be taking a look at the staged accident scene, but not really going into the specific details of the staging as much as discussing how the Saturn came to be there. Was the Saturn towed? And what evidence is there to support it being towed? And why does it bend the narrative steers so out of shape to suggest that it was towed or that Maura Murray wasn't at the scene? These are very curious questions in this case, which of course, the online discussion, unlike any other, definitely makes a good case study into the psychology of coincidence theorists, narrative steers, obfuscators, and to a lesser extent trolls because trolls are present in every case, but I don't want to leave them out because this case has them as well, so let's be inclusive and let's include the trolls in the psychological examinations here. So we'll be diving deep in typical mindshot fashion, doing a logical examination of how the Saturn came to be beyond the corner of the Weathern Barn in Haverhill, New Hampshire, and what weird goings on at UMass suggest that the Saturn was towed from UMass to New Hampshire with or without Mora, very possibly without her. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Help us get more mind-shocking podcast episodes out, not just in this case, but in many other cold cases because awareness is how cases get solved. If you like this particular episode, hit that like button, share it across social media platforms, of which you could find us on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon. Patrons do get priority. Case topic, logical analysis, code podcast, or request. You could also be a guest on the podcast, depending on your tier. Help support, help support the channel by becoming a patron. Also, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. Make sure you allow your device to have those notifications come through. If it still doesn't work, because YouTube can be glitchy at times, you could just go to youtube.com slash mindshock and manually check for updates and also peruse our ever-expanding back catalog. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section, and I can't believe I have to say this, but please at least have a uh, elementary level English comprehension base before doing so, because otherwise it's just a waste of time if whatever was presented was not comprehended. Comprehend first, then agree, disagree, pick apart, debunk, what have you, keep the discussion going. All right, so let's set the stage here. For whatever reason, Frank Kelly is one of the most ignored individuals by the narrative steers and the coincidence theorists. Now, the New Hampshire League of Investigators, of course, this independent coalition of former law enforcement and PIs, now, I'm not going to say they're not biased, of course they're biased, but they're going to be less biased than current law enforcement looking to preserve their egos. Now, we're not going to get into the varying degrees of bias, but they're going to be somewhat less biased. I mean, this is obvious to anybody who studied these statements, basic logic and reason. So let's go through a summary of Frank Kelly's statements here. He was active online as Weeper between 2005-2009. Again, his earlier statements in 2005, before the steer got out of control, before the, the steerers and obfuscators were scrambling to create oxygen series for the sole purpose of putting 
police conspiracies to bed, as Art Roderick clearly put it. So not finding the truth, not solving the case, simply dispelling theories they're uncomfortable with. So that was the only purpose of the Oxygen series. Some could argue to get farther from the truth, and this is, of course, very obvious in many ways. So, again, the statement's closer to 2004, so around 2005. They're very interesting because, again, this is before the steer, before a lot of the obfuscation. Of course, there were still some, but it's interesting to see how the narrative was spun over time. And, of course, we have some very active online steers in the past year, couple years, that are desperately and obviously trying to keep people away from logical, neutral examination to find the truth. So Kelly was one of a group of detectives for the Moore Murray PI Task Force team, the New Hampshire League of Investigators, formed in 2005. So between them, they had roughly 150 years of experience in criminal investigation. So again, we have narrative steers online. There's a lot of goofballs coming out of the woodwork. There's one particular goofball that posts just about every day. The obfuscation, the steering, so obvious. People who follow the case online know who this individual is. And just know either they're playing stupid or there's just not even a children's level mental capacity here. Now, again, we're stacking that against 150 years of experience in criminal investigation. <laughs> again, I don't want to use that as an appeal to authority logical fallacy. It's just to set the stage. It's not part of the argument directly to say who's wrong or who's right. It's simply to set the stage. Frank Kelly and these, and these PIs had direct access to the Saturn. Again, unlike some of these steers and obfuscators online. So John Healy, of course, was part of this group, and they were court-certified specialties. So this was defense, missing person, homicide investigation, accident reconstruction. Let me repeat that one again for all the goofballs out there. Accident reconstruction. So th these are court-certified specialists. Okay. For whatever reason, the steers and the obfuscators desperately want to discredit their findings of the accident scene being staged, of the Saturn not hitting a tree, and actually hitting a tow hitch, which we will be examining. Search and rescue statement and body language analysis. So this group, supposedly not influenced by the Murray family, and apparently there were some issues in communication with the Murray family, etc. But anyway, as far as officials, I mean, these were acting in non-official capacity, but former law enforcement officials, PIs, court-certified specialists, these individuals are among the most qualified and least biased. Again, I'm not going to say they're not biased. They do have active, con at the time, they had active connections to law enforcement. So they may not have investigated with 100% zero bias. But So there's some bias. It's just not going to be as biased because they're not the active officers assigned to the investigation. If they're not in on any kind of conspiracy they have nothing to hide. They're, they don't have their own incompetence to cover up, which is, of course, one of the main aspects of how conspiracies are carried out. So the conspiracy deniers, those that believe that humans cannot be fallible, cannot be corrupt, that human psychology does not exist, and humans do not protect their ego. So <laughs> these, these goofy individuals that, of course, circle, circle this case like moths to a flame. But... They found some curious things. Again, I'll reiterate here for Karen McNamara, she was told that she couldn't have seen an SUV because it was out of commission. And she was made to feel unsafe, which is why she went public with her actual name because she was intimidated by police. This is all ignored and swept under the rug, 
by Art Roderick, one of the prominent steers in the case, by all these other steers and obfuscators where the Oxygen Show came out and they were just easily hoodwinked because they just took on blind faith as gospel truth. Oh, was Cecil in the SUV the whole time? Nothing to see here. Witness say, yeah, credible. Yet completely ignoring her statements regarding law enforcement, regarding her being told she didn't see what she saw. And these other PIs that were involved in the conversation with her. Now, I don't know if it was ever exactly stated whether it was Frank Kelly or John Healy who were involved in those conversations with law enforcement that found it so puzzling that they told Karen McNamara that she couldn't have seen what she saw. But regardless, let's continue the explanation here. So the task force aided the state in anything relevant discovered by the team and the team would surrender it to the state. So the team never asked the state, nor did it want any information the state had collected. Professionally and legally to do so would constitute interference with an active investigation, which is a felony. And again, I'm just doing a quick rundown here from since deleted uh, Reddit comments that have uh, compiled this information from many different sources, no single source here. Kelly was tasked with focusing on the location of the disappearance. He felt that the general Haverhill area would prove more factually fruitful than Amherst. One PI was tasked with focusing on the Massachusetts connections. Name not stated here. Again, this was a group of PIs. I don't ever, I don't believe, I don't know if they ever gave a complete comprehensive list of every single PI that was on the task force. Other astute researchers can come up with one if they can find one. And it would be interesting to know who that PI was that investigated UMass in Massachusetts and what they found if they're still willing to speak about it. But it seems at a certain point, when a certain amount was found out, it seems like a lot of PIs, particularly with law enforcement connections, all of a sudden they want to have nothing to do with the case. I mean, if you checked out the Mind Shock More Murray Maine podcast, there was yet another, I don't know if he was a former police chief even possibly, who briefly investigated the case and then all of a sudden he wanted nothing to do with it. It's just really, and he's not the only one either, it's just really interesting where at a certain point, it seems like PIs, particularly with law enforcement connections, either they're told something, perhaps by FBI, perhaps by upper, higher ups in the New Hampshire State Police, that this case just uh, leave it alone. Stop investigating, stop talking about it. There's some kind of gag order, possibly because of some kind of intersecting FBI investigation or some other upper agency involvement. Again, we don't know what that means. Did Mora unwittingly stumble across some kind of situation? Did she unwittingly discover something at UMass, possibly involving corrupt UMPD, corrupt Amherst PD? Who knows? The corruption deniers, aka coincidence theorists, who don't think any conspiracies ever happen under any circumstances ever, they, of course, would not be even looking in that direction, so that, of course, they would not be capable of solving many, many cases that involve corruption. I mean, criminal conspiracies prosecuted every single day, every single day of the year. So this is just, again, basic human nature. Coincidence theorists are just human nature deniers as well. So we don't know what the issue is, but there just seems to be not a lot of people other than John Smith. Is he the only one brave enough to continue discussing the case beyond 2021 and beyond all these years? Are none of the other early investigators brave enough? I mean, we do have Guy Parody, but the opinions vary on that guy. And he's getting a lot from different psychics, which again, I'm not discrediting the psychics. I'm just saying there's different psychics that say different things. Not all psychics are honest, legitimate, or competent, just like any profession. If 99% of people are incompetent in their profession, then we have 1% of psychics who might be competent. Is Guy Parody talking to those particular psychics? I don't know. They seem to be singularly focused on Rick Forcier. But let's continue on here. Over the course of the two years investigating the task force concluded, concluded, Maura Murray's disappearance was not the result of suicide, accident, or voluntary act. This disappearance was the result of a crime. No sightings up to 2008 proved fruitful. Okay, let me repeat that again for the Clint Hardings of the world. So again, Clint Harding is supposedly a PI. But again, the mental capacity, I mean, he just, he can't even, he doesn't even know the difference between a fact and an opinion. 
So he believes the words of stressed out or grieving family members, people in just emotional states of turmoil, he takes their words on blind faith as gospel truth over all actual physical evidence, over 150 years of collective experience from specialists, court-certified specialists in defense, missing person, homicide investigation, accident reconstruction, search and rescue, statement and body language analysis. And yet Clint Harding thinks that this was some kind of a suicide, completely ignoring all logic, reason, science, facts, and basic English comprehension. Anyway, let me repeat just yet another time. The task force concluded. So at the end, they concluded. Maura Murray's disappearance was not the result of suicide, accident, or voluntary act. This disappearance was the result of a crime. And of course, we do not have the location of the crime. We don't know if it's UMass. We don't know where it is. Okay, moving on. The reasons for concluding this is a, this is a crime were threefold. The contradictory statements of witnesses, a.k.a. lies. <laughs> the, well, they could also have been mistaken. But again, that just goes to show, again, taking the words of humans on blind faith. For example, the coincidence theorists and the steerers who desperately maintain that Mora was at the Weathered Barn Corner, they view Butch Atwood as this infallible god, completely ignored his failed lie detector test, Completely ignore that he said that she didn't. Whoever was at the scene didn't look like the picture. Completely ignore the tr- uh, the p- transcript, uh, the dispatch transcript. Now the dispatcher is, of course, a more neutral party, especially during the live dispatch. Butch Atwood stated he hit a, p- a pine tree. He. So I don't know if the steers are just they don't understand pronouns. They don't know that he means male in this day and age. I mean I don't know. But, and then of course, Faith Westman, man smoking a cigarette. Now, again, we are in 2021. So perhaps the steerers and the obfuscators, they don't know that a man is male. So they think Maura Murray could be described as a man. Now, again, Maura Murray is not even manly. So you could make the case that, I don't know, perhaps a female that is, has the figure, and I don't know, a weightlifter or perhaps even more Murray in her country, uh, cross country running days in high school from a distance in a baggy jacket, that might have been more of a, a slim unisex type figure. But more Murray in 2004 was a very womanly, was very womanly in appearance, very female. So to make that mistake, particularly if she wasn't wearing a hat, her hair was down. So again, not that the, it's just, it's, it's really, it's really insane how it's mind shocking that the, how the steers and the obfuscators continue to maintain this level of silliness in clinging desperately on the words of Butch Atwood on nothing but faith and a prayer. It's just ignoring all logic and reason. It's just, it, it's endlessly mind shocking. I mean, it's almost as mind shocking as the case itself. So again, we don't have a female at the scene other than Butch and his ever-changing storylines. We have two references, all recorded in the dispatch, in dispatch, the most neutral party. See, somebody could have gotten to the dispatcher after the fact, but if if that dispatch transcript, if it's accurate, then, and it was recorded as is, is, if those are the words that were stated, what reason would she, would the dispatcher have? See, again, Butch Atwood, if he's the last person to see someone alive, how can you consider that a neutral party? Again, logic, not the strong suit of the steers and the obfuscators, but this is just basics. So we have multiple points of independent references to a male at the scene and only one to a, a one less objective less neutral reference one could argue the the least neutral reference if you're the last guy to see somebody alive that goes missing how can anybody hallucinate that Butch Atwood is a neutral party yet let alone an infallible god it's just really bizarre but that's the go-to to to the spheres and the obfuscators all right let's continue here 
Okay, the contradictory statements of witnesses, aka lies, the nature of the, quote, accident scene as discovered, the state informing the case to the New Hampshire St State Police Major Crimes Unit. Major Crimes Unit? Hmm. So no evidence of a crime being committed, but if this case is going New Hampshire State Police Major Crimes Unit. All right. It remains very unclear what transpired in Moore Murray's life from approximately 4 to 8 p.m. the evening of February 9th, 2004. It is not clear who drove the Saturn from Amherst, Massachusetts to the final location the vehicle was found, or whether it was driven at all. It's very probable Miss Murray was the person who made the bank and liquor stops. Eh, I would say possible. I don't know if it was probable. Receipts verify these purchases, but doesn't verify made by whom. After that point, nothing concrete is known. It is certain gasoline was purchased at some point north. No receipt has been recovered to verify the gas purchase. So it's actually not certain because if the vehicle was towed. So this is, uh, this is just a Reddit compilation from, from over four years ago. So I don't know if they didn't consider that the Saturn could have been towed from UMass. In which case, that would explain the gas tank being relatively full without any stop at a gas station. Because again, we're talking 2004 here. We're not talking 1994, even though even in 94, certain gas stations already had security cameras. And again, I didn't even mention the earlier accident. If you haven't checked out the Mind Shock podcast, the earlier accident. So again, there was a lot of online, there was a lot of police scanner chatter over a 7 p.m. accident. Now, at 4 p.m., Haverhill Police Cruiser 002, allegedly driven by the Haverhill Police Chief, suffered a minor accident, possibly along Swiftwater Road. He was assisted by his subordinate in SUV 001, who alleges alcohol was involved and they switched vehicles. I'll actually be doing a dedicated podcast on that entire situation. I'm still waiting on a few tidbits of information on that one. And... At some point, approximately any time between 6.15 and 7.30 p.m., according to Kelly, possibly at the junction of Route 302 and 112, or at another location, possibly Swiftwater Road, Moore Murray, inc or the Saturn, incurred damage to the vehicle, in which a rounded, blunt object, approximately 18 inches from the ground, impacted the front end of the car. It is not known if she struck it or the object made contact with the Saturn. Guardrails near the final resting place of the Saturn were not deformed in accordance with the damage. Quote, our collective opinion is that Moore Murray's involuntary actions began where the overhang damage to the front end of the Saturn occurred. So Frank Kelly does believe Moore Murray was at the scene, I believe, based on this, or I don't know if he's revised that since then. Or that's what he's just going with, or he wants that to be the appearance he's putting forward, possibly not to tip off the, uh, the responsible parties at UMass if she was harmed at UMass, which again, these are investigators. If you're arguing they know what they're doing with their 150 years of collective experience, I cannot rule out the possibility that they want to portray Maura Murray as being at the scene in order to possibly catch the real perpetrators. Maybe that's even what Haverhill is doing. I don't know. If you haven't checked out the Delphi Murders podcast on Mindshock, we go over a lot of strangeness in how law enforcement is handling the case. Again, that doesn't mean corruption. It might mean they have some kind of very, very definitive plan based on persons of interest already identified. And if there, this is if that case is some kind of case involving an accessory or two or three or whatever the case may be, they might have a very definite plan to catch the perpetrators. Is that what's going on in the Maura Murray case? I haven't specifically addressed that or spent a lot of time on it. Uh, I won't go too far into that now, but th it's a possibility. We can't rule that out. Of course, the case is still on song. Back to Frank Kelly's statements here. This, this location is as yet determined, though we suspect within one to three miles of the Saturn's location at the Red Barn. A scanner call verified by a local named Ann was transmitted around 7.05 p.m., possibly in reference to the above accident. Driver left in POV, privately owned vehicle. Now, this is another thing that the steers and the obfuscators desperately try to pretend doesn't exist. 
all of this scanner activity around 7 p.m. And it's not just Anne. There were several others. Of course, I went over this in the seven in the earlier act the earlier accident more Murray podcast. So make sure you check that out if you have not. Multiple witnesses. Again, more neutral parties. They are more neutral. I'm not obviously I can't say they're 100 percent neutral. We don't know them, but they're more neutral than Butch or Faith. At approximately 7.25 p.m. is when Faith and Tim Westman hear the acceleration of a vehicle followed by a thud. They make that call. At this point, Kelly improvises. It is his opinion, due to the lack of skid marks or road debris, that the vehicle may have lawfully approached the curve of the weathered barn, but turned into Old Peter's Road, lights off, backed up, accelerated, knocked snow off the embankment on the western side of 112. The direction of snow shearing would indicate the travel of the Saturn. Unsure if such was observed on scene. If true, one wonders about the incurrence of the driver's side damage. To my knowledge, there were no notes referring to the car's rear end condition. An impact with the snowbank would at least yield some snow transfer evidence. The driver corrected the car to aim its backside approach 100 feet east of the Blue Ribbon Tree and backed up to that point. It is believed that this was the action John Murat observed from his kitchen window. Officially, the car traveled at an unknown speed due east, clipped the embankment on the Westman side of 112, spun out, and came to rest near the tree. It didn't spin out clearly. A dry road would suffer skid marks in such a situation. Perhaps it clipped the tree, slowed to a stop, and the driver turned the vehicle due turned the vehicle due west in the wrong lane. Why the wrong lane is still a mystery. Of course, these are all theories in this uh, just mishmash of sources here. But if you just look at the Saturn, the compare vehicles that hit a tree and didn't hit a tree, there's virtually no damage around the bumper area which would mean something had to have been above the bumper. So unless you're arguing that it was one of these weird L-shaped trees, which of course were not at the scene, I don't know how the steers and the obfuscators can expect anyone to believe, you know, on nothing but faith, that the Saturn hit a tree. It's just, it's really bizarre. And completely, again, disregard 150 years plus of court-certified accident reconstructionists. And I believe they even had two other privately contracted accident reconstruction experts verify this information as well. This is not one guy's opinion. And again, these are more neutral parties than the law of people desperately grasp at Cecil Smith's police report that it hit a tree. I mean, I guess that's their only, that's, that's one point of reference from a non-neutral party. Whereas we have multiple, multiple points of reference with many years of experience, much in excess of Cecil Smith's. Again, we're not going to call Cecil Smith having zero experience with car accidents. Of course he does. Does he have 150 years plus? And then on top of that, independent accident reconstructionists who have nothing to gain or lose? They're much more objective parties. And yet the steers and the obfuscators, the coincidence steers, they cling desperately like it's some kind of safety blanket to Cecil Smith's police report, which has many issues, of course, and many issues and accuracies. I mean, anybody that's trusting Cecil Smith's police report on nothing but, again, faith in a prayer. I mean, is that the motto of the coincidence theorists and the steers? Faith in a prayer? <laughs> Because they don't have any actual real evidence. They don't go by logic or science or, or anything legitimate or valid. It's just they have faith in fallacies and that's it. I mean, but if not for them, mind shock wouldn't exist. So again, I guess we have to be thankful that we can actually push for truth in this case. Kelly believed the Saturn was planted there near federal territory to mess with jurisdiction rights in a premeditated manner. Now let's, ex let's expand on that. Now, the, the White Forest, the National Park, is not that far. Was the plan to get it into the National Forest? And that we already had uh, jurisdiction issues. The steers and the obfuscators dismiss the reports of the jurisdiction issues, but they, there were two witnesses who overheard an argument over jurisdiction. Then again, the steers and the obfuscators and the coincidence steers, they pretend that there was no denial of John Monaghan, state trooper, on the scene. In the early days, 
they denied his very presence. They said there was no state trooper at the scene. Why would they do that? If everything is above board, what's going on? And of course, John Monahan needs his own episode. But Frank Kelly, from everything we're reading here, Frank Kelly does not appear to be a stupid man, unlike many other individuals involved in the case, particularly online commenters. But there's a reason he thinks these things. He confers with his fellow investigators, again, over 150 years of collective experience in these multiple fields, including accident reconstruction. So, uh, psych you know, there's certain basic criminal psychology, all these things. If there was no White Mountains National Forest there, that would be a point away from the staging theory, the jurisdiction theory. But since it's right there at the end of the road, I mean, again, the coincidence theorists ignore these mountains and mountains and mountains and mountains of coincidences. These multiple elephants in the room. I mean, it's astounding. It's astounding. The level of hallucination some of these theorists, obfuscators, and coincidence theorists have to have to pretend all of these variables are non-factors. It's just, I mean, it's insane. I mean, of course it's possible some of them are non-factors. I mean, every case is allowed one or two coincidences. Once you start pushing into double, triple digit coincidences, I mean, unless you're completely brain dead, one has to think, perhaps they're not all coincidences, but the steers and the obfuscators don't, which that's what makes this case such a, such a just fascinating psychology study. So we do have, so it, the jurisdiction rights were clearly messed with. There were issues there. And that's not even getting into the whole tow situation. But let's, uh, let's move on here. Butch Atwood, the school bus driver, might have happened upon the physical scene before SUV 001. This makes the most sense. It would explain his encounter with the Saturn driver and the reason it took Cecil Smith nearly 20 minutes to arrive on scene. Why? Because one of their own was already there. But as later explained by law enforcement, the SUV was out of commission that night. I take this to be a cover for a chief who was off the record by 7 p.m. due to impairment or another reason unknown to us. So again, Frank Kelly would be more neutral than currently employed police officers covering for their chief or jurisdiction. Butch Atwood later claimed he saw a long-haired woman at the scene. Butch Atwood had serious continuity problems in his descriptions of his brief encounter with the driver. Now, again, with the steers, obfuscators, coincidence steers, what they completely ignore is that Frank Kelly, John Healy, these investigators had direct access to Butch Atwood, something we don't have. So if they find his testimony fishy, if they find that his statements were conflicting and his stories ever changing, perhaps that shouldn't be ignored. The ability of the steers, the obfuscators, and the coincidence theorists to sweep things under the rug is unparalleled. I mean, it's absolutely mind-shocking. Again, we're talking about investigators, 150 years of collective experience. In interviewing people as well, in studying in studying body language, they deal they they frequently deal with criminals. Hundred fifty years, and yet the coincidence theorists and the obfuscators and the steers would have everybody take it on faith that there's no issue with Butch Atwood's testimony, and that it was definitely more at the scene. <laughs> I mean, it's so comical. It's absolutely comical. So Butch Atwood had serious continuity problems in his description of his brief encounter with the driver. That is the reason that task force put Butch Atwood on their list of suspicious persons. Also of note, the Westmans never described a bus at the scene. It's also believed if they did see it, the way it was parked would have made it difficult, if not impossible, to see the Saturn or its driver. Butch Atwood left the scene and called law enforcement. And I guess at that point, that's when they saw the man smoking a cigarette. I don't know. So they wouldn't have been able to see the driver of the bus. Now, if that's the case, was Butch Atwood not the driver of the bus? 
And we're not going to go into that rabbit hole because, I don't know, again, this case is unsolved. There's clearly something missing here. And those who claim or pretend that it's definitely not this or it's definitely not that, it's just strange. How would they know? It seems quite silly to pretend. At some point during or following the second accident, Karen McNamara left her job at the cottage, traveled along Swiftwater, and was passed by SUV-001. I remember that the two men exchanged vehicles. Kelly speculated that the SUV was originally headed towards Route 302, the possible site of the first accident, got the tip that the driver had left the scene, changed course at the intersection of 112, and instead of going west towards 302, proceeded east on 112. At that point, Karen McNamara had entered 112 from a point farther east than the SUV and was passed by that driver a second time with lights flashing. Ahead of Karen McNamara by a few moments, the SUV's driver had found the Saturn stopped along the Marat property in the wrong lane, parking nose to nose with the Saturn. That is when Karen McNamara passed the scene and claimed she saw no one at either vehicle or at least outside their vehicle. It is unknown if the SUV lights were on. I'm gonna speculate here that just as Kelly believed the Saturn to have entered and turned about face on Old Peters with lights off to avoid detection, once upon the Saturn, the driver of the SUV had also turned its lights off. Otherwise, I think someone would have noted that. So, again, we have Frank Kelly proving he's not a stupid man. Now, he might be wrong, but his observations, again, how many times did he visit the scene? How many hours did he spend looking at the Saturn, which he had direct access to and took photos of? Some of these photos that are circulated of the Saturn, these are Frank Kelly's photographs. Again, access to colleagues, 150 years of collective experience in accident reconstruction and general criminal matters, how criminal minds work, how people stage accidents, how people try to go undetected or escape scenes of accidents. These are not stupid people. So you could say he's wrong, but to completely discredit him in favor of people with English comprehension issues like Clint Harding, it just seems, it seems insane, but par for the course for coincidence theorists and narrative spirit. Anyway, when we look at what Kelly is theorizing possibly happened, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. If the driver of 001, possibly not Cecil Smith, but who knows, possibly Cecil Smith. Apparently, he couldn't remember what vehicle he was driving. Now, you know what's strange, though? How often did he have to switch vehicles? How often did he have to switch vehicles with drunken police chief Jeff Williams? Because if that's a frequent thing, but if it's not a frequent thing, you would think he would remember the vehicles, particularly the night that Moore Murray Saturn was found there, which, I mean... I don't know how many other prominent missing persons cases that have the largest file in New Hampshire state history occur in Cecil Smith's jurisdiction. I don't know how many other high profile cases he's been a part of, but for him to say that he doesn't even know what he was driving for John Monahan thinking it could have been the sedan with fire department members, all these other members saying that Cecil was driving the sedan. So it prob he probably, would, based on, again, multiple points of reference, instead of propaganda documentaries, we have, to, we have to look and see that most likely Cecil was not driving the SUV. He was in the sedan. So whoever was in the SUV was going to the site of the first accident, the 7 p.m. accident. Then they changed course. That perfectly explains the scenario. This is Frank, what Frank Kelly believed, along with his colleagues' 150 years of experience. It, that seems perfectly logical. Again, coincidence theorists, steers, and obfuscators, they're allergic to logic, so they're, they're not going to want to look at that. But that seems to be highly likely. Okay, let's move on. The second probable point Butch Atwood arrived on scene was following the SUV's encounter, and by then, the cop was gone. Interesting. We're not going to go 
far into that. Okay, Butch Atwood parked his bus in a manner unusual to his neighbors, pointing it due west across the front of the bays of the bus garage and away from the floodlight on his property nearest the road. From that vantage point, he couldn't see through the pines to the Saturn. Kelly observed there was a reason for parking that way. Let me repeat that again. Kelly observed there was a reason for parking that way. Again, Frank Kelly. Access to Butch Atwood, access to the scene, access to the Saturn with 150 years of experience with his colleagues. So maybe Steer's obfuscators, they, they're going to say that they're going to dismiss everything Frank Kelly says and say, oh, that's just another coincidence that Butch Atwood parked away. He never actually parked any other time except on that night. <laughs> I mean, again, the coincidence stack is so high. It's just mind shocking. He thinks that Butch Atwood was worried. So there are three buildings, the residence, the bus bays, and a workshop garage business office with the floodlight on the roof. There's no light atop the bay, interestingly. Was he hiding something or someone? A bus is high off the ground, and though Kelly didn't believe Maura Murray ever set foot on the bus or was involved in the earlier hit to the Saturn, it's possible he tried to obscure something behind the bus. SUV 001 question mark. Huh. And even though this is mind shock, we actually never discussed that theory before. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. So Butch Atwood, apparently, again, local rumors state that Butch Atwood was friends with Cecil Smith. His mother volunteered for the police department. He most likely was familiar, if not friends, with other officers. Did he feel intimidated to the point where he had to hide a drunk Jeff Williams and that vehicle? Or maybe not. Maybe not. Perhaps Williams was elsewhere. Perhaps Williams was not the driver of 001. Perhaps there was some kind of evidence on 001. And Butch Atwood was intimidated into hiding SUV 001 on his property, and that's why he parked the bus that way, and his statements are so conflicting. So Kelly believed it was possible Butch Atwood was monitoring police activity with a scanner from his enclosed enclosed porch, but this is pure speculation. It's, pos it's impossible to believe that Butch Atwood still believed to be in the bus for at least for most of a long time, according to neighbors, could have missed a car picking up more Murray or whomever drove the Saturn, or that driver walking under the floodlight to points due east. Another point here, though, if this was a law enforcement impersonator, now again, we went over that, I went over those issues as well. If you haven't checked out the police impersonator Mind Shock Maura Murray episode, check that out. There was actual other police impersonator issues in the area, not to mention an individual who was actually arrested for impersonating a police, enforce, uh, a police officer in that area. Yet another coincidence to add to the stack. It's just mind boggling the amount of coincidences in that area. Now, was Butch Atwood's friends with this person, or did this person either have a gun or somehow otherwise intimidating Butch Atwood into helping him? Is it possible that a police impersonator did something to Maura Murray, if she was at the scene, or the driver? Wow, that would be quite a tangled web. If Maura Murray was harmed at UMass, never left UMass, someone else drove the Saturn up, either by tow or otherwise, that vehicle got into an accident with either a drunk Jeff Williams or a police impersonator. So Maura Murray's already harmed at UMass by other parties, and this party either complicit to that scheme or just someone paid off to dump a Saturn and doesn't know anything that happened to Maura Murray, this individual, male or female, or one of each, they're harmed by corrupt Haverhill PD, and Butch Atwood is intimidated into helping them cover that up. Would that explain everything we see here? <laughs> and if that police impersonator has some kind of connections to law enforcement that they didn't want to blow the whistle on it, and is there also some kind of overlapping FBI issue? 
wow, that is quite a tangled web, is it not? But would it explain everything? I don't know. The astute Mindshock listeners can chime in on that theory. Let's continue here. Meanwhile, construction worker Rick Forcier had con continuity issues in his statements to the police, as Butch Atwood had. To this day, it's unclear if Rick Forcier was at his trailer watching TV while the scene unfolded just yards down Route 112, or was in fact en route from a drywall job in Franconia that Monday night. I don't know about you, but Mondays generally are not good TV nights. Well, unless Feetball was on. Possible. So, how difficult is it to confirm with Rick Forcier's uh, employers in Franconia for that drywall job what time he left? I'm assuming law enforcement did that. Either way, if Rick Forcier, I mean, this is a small area, if Rick Forcier was friendly or with other individuals or somehow knew the police impersonator or other police enforcement individuals and was also part of the intimidation, depending on when the intimidation started, that would explain conflicting statements because there's pre-intimidation, post-intimidation statements to cover whatever up. Again, I'm not claiming to know anything. This is mind shock. The only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. Rick Forcier was compelled to make at least one, if not two, statements to law enforcement within two weeks of the disappearance. Two months out, a witness overheard him make small talk at a lo local establishment, and that person calls law enforcement on it. Law enforcement asked Rick Forcier to return for a statement of clarification. Rick Forcier explained that he had to check his work notes, but he saw a young runner of indeterminate identity, so he doesn't even state whether it's a male or a female, along Route 112, five miles east of the Saturn location upon his return from Franconia. At that meeting, he claimed to be unaware of the scene right before him before turning left on Bradley Hill Road to his residence. Two continuity problems right there. And let me just re reiterate this for the coincidence theorists, the steers and the obfuscators who cling desperately to the narrative that Maura Murray was spotted in that area, or even a female was spotted. Again, Rick Forcier never saw a female. He saw a young runner of indeterminate identity. Make of that what you will, but there is no one on scene who saw Maura Murray other than Butch Atwood who said whoever was in, whoever the driver was did not look like the pictures. That's all we have. So we have all these multiple points of reference from more independent parties who claim it was a male on the scene. Okay. Butch Atwood supposedly helped the search with Cecil Smith in his Bronco and was pointed in his descriptions of his search as if to deliberately place himself somewhere else he may have been seen. Two points of interest here according to Kelly. French Pond Road, where he and his brother have ice fishing positions, and the Swiftwater Stage Shop. So did Butch Atwood lie to distance himself from an incriminating scene, as in the actual accident site? Did Butch Atwood get his two locations convoluted? In one version, the Saturn's driver was found behind the airbags. Airbags deflate quickly, so was he referring to a point immediately following the true accident, or were the airbags already deployed and the driver was driving the car for some distance already when he happened upon her? There's three reasons here why he lied. Delusions of grandeur, he claimed to have been a cop himself at one point, false, frightened by someone, or protecting someone his brother, perhaps. Now, I just had another mind-shocking thought. Let, so let's say for the sake of argument, again, I'm just theorizing here. I'm not taking anything on faith or pretending to know anything, unlike the coincidence there's the steers and the obfuscators. If Moore Murray was harmed at UMass, whomever harmed her, if they enlisted the help of either another criminal or shady individual to get rid of the Saturn, either via tow or other means, this individual, if they're involved in the criminal element, they have no close family or friends, just other criminals that associate with them, they would not report that person missing. Is this the person that was involved in some kind of altercation 
beyond the Weathern Barn Corner, either with a police officer, a police impersonator, Butch Atwood, Butch Atwood's brother, who knows, and they had to kill this individual, or the individual died of an accident, and Butch Atwood dumped this individual's body either in this ice fishing pond or whatever, this male, possibly, and that's why he said it was more Murray, because he was trying to throw them off. Because if everybody's looking for a female, he knows he didn't kill a female. So he'll pass a lie detector. Again, he has a hard condition, so maybe not. But supposedly he failed one, passed one, whatever the case may be. He'll, he'll make a lot of conflicting statements. He'll be very nervous because maybe he did assist in the cover-up of disposing of some kind of male criminal of some kind. Or a male. Maybe he didn't know he was a criminal. Whatever the case may be. Maybe this male attacked him. Who knows what the deal was? Maybe he was justified in defending himself if this was Butch Atwood or his brother or a law enforcement officer or a police impersonator, whatever the case may be. Maybe these people are friends. Maybe they're not. Maybe they intimidated each other. Who knows? But if some, if a non, whoever was this individual, not Moore Murray, was disposed of, would that explain all this funny business? Would that explain all these changing stories? Still doesn't solve the Maura Murray case, but doesn't it solve all the issues going on here? Doesn't really explain the, the Bill Roush situation either, but it's just more food for thought because this is mind shock. Okay, the last point here. The dog walker was in the vicinity of the Swiftwater stage shop around 7 p.m. She observed a red truck with Massachusetts plates with an eagle decal on the back of the cab window and wooden sided bays as if a wood transporter slow into the stage shop and park momentarily. So again, there's multiple issues with the eagle decal. I will be doing a follow-up red truck episode, red truck part two in this series. There are even more curious parties with connections to UMass who had red trucks in the Haverhill area, who happened to repaint them. We're talking about more than one individual, all coincidental, I'm sure, I'm sure. Anyway, uh, continuing on here, the dog walker felt she was being observed, then the truck pulled out, drove slowly up the next hill, then took off towards the accident scene. It's unclear whether she, when or where, when or if she saw it again, because if she spent the next half hour inside the store shooting the breeze, it's either after her time inside or before she said she saw the truck turning into Bradley Hill Road or Old Peters Road. At some point, she approached the scene and walked down Old Peters Road where her dog is startled by a noise. Who knows? I've always thought it's possible the driver left on foot as there was only one set of foot tracks leading away from the Saturn, first due east to Bradley Hill, where the dogs later lost the scent and doubled back to Old Peter's and left the scene that way. And again, that's all disputed. This was just opinions of people. This was not Frank Kelly's specific opinion. And this might have been a conflation of two different individuals. Uh, one who heard the noise, one who spotted the red truck. And they were stopping red trucks all night that night. So again, something that's not talked about. Red truck, Massachusetts plates, not Massachusetts plates. What the steers and the obfuscators also like to sweep under the rug, the law enforcement was stopping red trucks all night. So the takeaway here from all this information thus far is that Frank Kelly is not a stupid man. The New Hampshire League of Investigators has over 150 years of collective experience in criminal investigation, encompassing accident reconstruction, body language, criminal psychology. These are, this is, these are court certified specialists. These are not Joe Schmoes online. These, these are individuals with a lot of experience with direct access to witnesses like Butch Atwood, the Saturn, and the alleged accident scene with that were privy to information early on, early on when it would be the most accurate. So these are just a lot of things to think about. That was this episode. In the next episode, we'll be going over the specific tow situation. There was just a lot more to go over with Frank Kelly. So stay tuned. I'll be releasing the next one pretty soon. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind regarding this podcast, leave them in the comment section. And again, please have at least a children's level 
understanding of English comprehension. Otherwise, it's just the pollution of the comment section. And I'm sure that's what the steers and the obfuscators want to prevent actual meaningful logical discussion to move the case forward. So just be mindful of that. If you enjoy the podcast, you want to contribute, you can donate to a PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications. Make sure your louder device to have those notifications come through. If still not working, you can just go to youtube.com slash mindshock to manually check the latest episodes and our ever-growing back catalog. If you want to keep awareness up in the Maura Murray case and other cases, hit that like button and share this podcast across social media platforms, of which you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon. Patrons do get a priority for case topic, logical analysis, code podcast, or request. You could also be a guest on the podcast, depending on your tier. This is Bruce McGuire, signing off. Catch you guys next time. So, all right, let's talk about uh, let's talk about John Healy for a moment. So Healy is one of the primary investigators early on in the case. He's been involved in Witness A's account. That he believes the accident was staged as well. I think that's what he said. So people have pointed out that John Healy has actually had a history of working very closely with the DEA, FBI, IRS. HLS, AFTD, and other agencies. So apparently he provides preliminary investigations done before issuing search warrants, raids, stings, background checks, and things of that nature. So if there was a bunch of weird things happy, happening that night, was John Healy involved in this whole scenario before he became officially involved in Moore Murray's case? Do you know who John Healy is, Maxwell? No, who's that? I just said he kind of went away from the case, but uh, John Healy, I'll, I'll give a couple of snippets of what John Healy's statements John Healy has made. In 2006, he said, even if the court decided that some of all, or all of the records should be released, we don't want them. John Healy, a former state trooper who was coordinating the volunteer effort, said Wednesday, we understand the damage it could do if certain investigative theories or avenues that led to dead ends were made public. That's a strange thought. In 2007, Healy said, although police have said Mora crashed her car into the trees, he and other investigators do not believe that to be true. He said, based on the damage to the Saturn, that it appears as if the car was traveling at a slow speed when it may have struck the underside of another vehicle. The actual crash site may have taken place somewhere else. Not only that, they believe Murray may not have been the young woman then first student school bus driver Butch Atwood saw. They believe the scene where the Saturn was found by Atwood may have been staged. You know what's weird, though? Why would he say that if he's trying to put the lid on this whole operation? So that's, yeah, John Healy is a, a curious cat because we really, he's saying this stuff, but on the other hand, he was involved with a lot of law enforcement agencies unless they didn't tell him what really happened. And he is being honest. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's bizarre. So in 2007, about the wine box, John Healy said the box was damaged, perhaps in the accident, and reddish spots resembling wine were also found on the road. According to investigator John Healy, Sergeant Smith later recovered a Coke bottle that contained a red liquid with a strong alcoholic odor. None of the other bottles of alcohol that Mora had bought in Amherst were found in the car. In 2009, he stated, I'm totally befuddled said John Healy, president of the New Hampshire League of Investigators, a group of private investigators who's been volunteering on the case for four years. The thing that is really, really tough for us, and it's got to be tough for the state police, is the time frame. Literally, this was in the blink of an eye, Healy said. Did a car stop? Did she walk away? We just don't know that. Healy, a former state police lieutenant, said investigators have not shelved the case. Trust me, these people are working their tails off. In 2004, a report states Fred Murray initially worked closely with Healy's group. In 2005, though, he sued the state police in an attempt to make public all of the records pertaining to the investigation. He was unsuccessful, and what's more, Healy and his volunteers publicly disagreed with his effort. Fred said more conflicts arose, so he stopped working with them. He shut the door on me and the whole group of volunteers ever since, Healy says. 
Healy's group is still trying to find Mora and by his estimates has spent thousands of hours working leads. We're doing this for their whole family, Healy said. You know what's interesting? What would have prompted Fred Murray to kind of cut ties with John Healy and this group? Did he smell something fishy about what they were doing? Were they kind of a, somewhat of a controlled opposition instituted by the DEA, FBI, or other agencies to put the lid on it? What do you think? Um, yeah, I don't know, man. Maxwell Army. Sid, what do you think? Sid Irwin. Yes. What do you think? Do you think John Healy was just kind of, and this whole League of Investigators was kind of a controlled opposition instigated by DEA, FBI to keep the lids on the case, and Fred Murray kind of sensed that at some point, so he decided to sue the state and sever ties with this group of investigators? It could be, very well. It wouldn't be, um... Maxwell, I just repeated it. Did you hear that or no? He's a, that he's a controlled opposition and things like that. Yeah, is, and Fred Murray somehow got the inclination that something was off with Healy and the group, which is why he cut ties. Different thing that I mean, what may I want to work with that group that potentially is trying to attain their own goals while searching for your daughter and potentially holding up a case so you can find it? Ah, uh, that would be. The only thing, yeah, the only thing that doesn't make uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense is why they would say the accident was staged. But uh, in the narrative steering, let's move to 2014. Healy, the private investigator, was blunt. He believes there is zero chance Moore is alive. He thinks she was abducted and murdered, and he's confident that one day the case will be solved. Everything is pretty much on hold and at a standstill. When we get a tip or idea, we will be on it, Healy said. Really, the next step is we're hoping somebody somewhere knows something and will come forward. He also stated she got into the wrong car, she went to the wrong house, Healy said last week. One minute she's there, ten minutes later she's not. In Mora's case, we're one step away from thinking alien abduction. It happened so fast, Healy said. Strelzen said it's unlikely but not impossible that the young woman had gone off to start a new life, but he and Healy agree that kind of disappearing takes careful planning, help, and resources. So it seems like all these guys, if it is some kind of law enforcement conspiracy or DEA cover up or witness protection, it seems like all of these people are kind of steering a narrative to get nobody to consider those possibilities and to keep it the focus on, oh, she went to the wrong house. She got picked up by a bad guy. Just kind of kind of weird, kind of weird. Sure.